This last part of the pulley question has some interesting facets that ask us to consider um, when they're, uh, it, it's very complicated and a number of uh, variables are changing. So we have in this case is a similar pulley to the others that we've seen so far, uh, but it's a new pulley, uh, pulley C. So we have a long cord of negligible mass and that at first glance may not seem important, but it actually very, very is very, very important um, to not being confused about this. So mass of cord equals zero. And we'll see why that comes up in a little bit later. Um, is wrapped around a third pulley C attached to the spring scale. So this is like the very first part. We're using a spring scale. We're going to pull it downward. And that way we know exactly what the force is and we can determine that it's constant. So we have a constant force S being pulled down. Spring scale moves down a significant distance. The vertical portion of the cord moves closer and closer to the center of the pulley. And so what we're actually seeing here is that if we look at this overall pulley, here is R. But over time, what's actually happening is R decreases. They don't come out and say that explicitly, but that's actually what's happening. So um, R decreases over time. And so, you know, what we could think about this R, um, we know the uh, moment of inertia is proportional to MR squared. Well, notice what they've said. Is, so what's happening is this whole system of the pulley and the cord has uh, a moment of inertia. And as the, the mass of the cord, the cord is being unwound, there becomes less and less mass on the outside and, and uh, proportionately more mass on the inside. But that's, they told us that the mass of the cord is zero. So that's actually not happening. They're saying there's no mass here. So there's no change in the moment of inertia, which is a very important thing, but it's also very, very easy to miss. So no change in I. And that's why they put that qualifying set statement in right at the very, very beginning. Okay. But so what is changing if the moment of inertia isn't changing? So if we look at torque, our torque is I alpha. We know that this remains the same. Um, does the alpha change in any particular way? Is the torque actually changing? Well, let's consider other formula. RF sine theta. All right. So just like all the previous examples, the... Uh, the lever arm is at 90 degrees to the radius, so um, the sine theta is not changing. The F that's being applied is a constant force. We're told that it's constant force, so that's equal. But R is decreasing. So if these two remain the same and R is decreasing, the torque is decreasing. Now, if the torque is decreasing and the moment of inertia remains the same, that means the acceleration must be decreasing. The acceleration must be decreasing. And so that's kind of a powerful chain of reasoning there. Um, but notice by writing down these torque relationships, we can trace them down as to what's happening. So now predict how the net torque exerted on the pulley and the rotational kinetic energy will be changing. All right, so the torque. If alpha is, we know the torque is decreasing. The torque is decreasing. All right, so the net torque. So we can explain that because um, what's happening is the sine theta, you know, torque is, is RF sine theta. And we go on to say the sine theta remains the same and the force is the same and that's given and R decreases. Therefore, the net torque decreases. Boom, we've explained it. So what's happening now with the rotational kinetic energy? This is more challenging. So our rotational kinetic energy uh, is one half I omega squared. All right, so we already know that the I in this particular case, so the one half, of course, is going to stay the same. The I is staying the same over time. But what's happening to the rotational velocity over time? Now, I want to go back to something we said in a previous question. 
that you know this force is just like we could replace this with the constant mass like in the previous example and that mass is going to accelerate all right so the mass is going to accelerate because due to its weight mg its mass isn't going to change g isn't going to change um and uh, it does not say whether it is frictionless in this case but in either case this the force due to gravity is going to stay the same and so even if there's an opposing force, the net force will be the same if that frictional force is constant. So we basically have this object free falling. It's exerting a force. It's uh, exerting a force. The thing is, is accelerating, but it's the rate of that acceleration is less. So when have we seen that? When, say, something's free falling, we, if, we've, if we've seen something free falling, is there ever a time the acceleration goes from 10 to 9 to, da, 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 to even 0 and eventually stops? And yes, that's a case where there is air resistance and we reach terminal velocity. And so there's a chance here, just like with terminal velocity, to have several misconceptions. Um, and so one of those misconceptions is, is that as you're getting, as you approach this terminal velocity, your speed is decreasing. That's not true. The acceleration is decreasing. But even if the acceleration is one meters per second squared, you are still getting faster. So until this point where terminal velocity is reached, you are getting faster and faster and faster until you no longer get faster. But at no point in time do you get slower. And that's the easy thing to mix, to miss. So in this case, throughout the entire time, the omega is increasing. And so now for the rotational kinetic energy, we say it's going to increase um, because the rotational kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. Um, I remains the same. Um, and omega increases until alpha and the net torque equals zero, at which time the EK would remain constant. And that's the last of the last part of this question.